Al, bienvenidas y bienvenidos a esta sexta sec sección de, del ciclo de conferencia en éticas aplicadas. As you know, this encounter is in, in, in English, so that's the language I will, I will continue using. Um, my name is Sofia La, I'm an art historian and I'm an assistant professor at uh, the Instituto de Estetica here at university. Today, my role will be to introduce our guest speaker, Professor Lori Grun, as well as um, Professor Pelayo Benavides, who will be providing a response to Professor Grun's um, presentation. And I'll also be moderating the, the time allocated for questions and comments after, um, after the presentation. Um, before introducing Professor Grun and hearing from her, I'd like to briefly present the conference cycle that this seminar belongs to which is itself part of um, a larger institutional project um, aimed at promoting new initiatives in, in applied ethics here at the university. It's a project that involves most of the university schools and faculties, and the project in itself seeks to promote teaching, research, discussion, and outreach in a wide array of contemporary topics related to applied ethics. Um, as an interdisciplinary project, this includes a research examining questions and problems concerning the economy, politics, the environment, human rights, technology, and data science, among other things. It's one of the university top priorities at the moment, and it's an initiative that aims to make of ethical deliberation a salient concerns for our students, alumni, and the community as a whole. And this includes, of course, the promotion of discussion regarding our own ethics as an institution. The aim is to contribute with interdisciplinary research of high quality and to create a platform for dialogue and discussion at both a national and a regional level. So as part of this project, we are inaugurating this annual conference series in applied ethics, which features world leading international experts working on a variety of topics. You may have heard some of these presentations already, and if you haven't, you're very welcome to, um, to look at the YouTube channel of the Applied Ethics Initiatives, where you will find recording of the, of the previous talks and presentation. Now, today it is with great pleasure that I'd like to introduce our main speaker, Professor Laurie Grun. Professor Grun is the William Griffin Professor of Philosophy at Wesleyan University, where she coordinates Wesleyan Animal Studies. She's also a professor of feminist, gender, and sexuality studies and science and society. She's the author and editor of 11 books, including Ethics and Animals, an introduction, Cambridge, published by Cambridge University Press in 2011, The Ethics of Captivity, published by Oxford University Press in 2014, um, Entangled Empathy, published by Lantern in 2015, as well as Critical Terms for Animal Studies, published by the University of Chicago Press in 2018. She's a fellow of the Hastings Center for Bioethics and a faculty fellow at Tufts Cumming School of Veterinary Medicine Center for Animals and Public Policy. And she was also the first chair of the Faculty Advisory Committee of the Center for Prison Education at Wesleyan. Professor Grun has also documented the history of the first hundred chimpanzees in research in the US. And she also has an evolving website that documents the journey to sanctuary of the remaining chimpanzees in research lab, which is a project called The Last Thousand. Um, so without any further ado, very welcome, uh, Professor Grun. We're delighted to have you today. And just one word of housekeeping before um, letting you uh, start with your presentation, I'd like to remind everyone to please mute their mics during the presentation. Thank you, Sophie. Um, and I'm glad you mentioned uh, the chimpanzees because you'll be seeing some of them um, on these slides. Uh, so uh, today I want to talk um, through the ideas of empathy. Empathy itself has um, invoked a lot of discussion as of late in the wake of the uh, recent Trump presidency in the United States and that administration's lack of empathy. Um, a number of people um, in very high places have been talking about empathy. Um, we also have been hearing a lot about empathy in light of the devastation of the uh, tragic COVID-19 pandemic. And you might think that empathy is the kind of thing that's generally thought to be a good thing that's practiced by good people. Um, and in some scholarly uh, circles, 
um, there has been criticism of empathy. And it, I want to talk a little bit about that criticism before I defend some views um, that I think are worth considering, particularly in our context about ethical and moral deliberations. Um, so some of the critics worry that empathy really should not play a role in our moral lives and our moral deliberations. Some of the current criticism of empathy has echoes of a tension that emerged in a slightly older set of debates between what was called the justice tradition and the care tradition in ethics. And this particular um, debate, as it were, where you have justice opposed to care um, was shown, um, I think, by many theorists to be in part a misconstrual because justice and care aren't really at odds with one another. Um, and our normative theories in general, that is our, our ethical deliberation in general, is going to be better when we're concerned about both justice and care. Some of the arguments for thinking more systematically about moral emotions generally and empathy in particular have met up with some of the same kind of dichotomous thinking. Um, and in my talks around the world, when I'm speaking about empathy, often people think that it isn't um, consistent with more traditional principles of justice. And I think that's that's a mistake to think in, in these kind of oppositional ways because empathy isn't really distinct from reason or deliberation. As many have argued, emotions are judgments, they're types of judgments and understanding the ways in which moral deliberation is informed by emotion is important for gaining a better understanding of the fullness of our moral agency. But even some of those who accept the centrality of emotion in moral de deliberation haven't looked favorably upon empathy. And so in this talk, I'm going to suggest that the worries um, that the critics have expressed can be overcome. And more importantly, argue that empathy can and should play a central role in our ethical discussions. Um, so the paper has four parts. I'm going to try my best not to, um, <laughs> to not, not to talk for too long. Um, the first uh, section, I'll raise a number of the concerns about empathy that comes from the most vocal empathy skeptics. And then in the second section, I'll provide some consens conceptual clarification of empathy to facilitate an understanding of the particular view that I defend, which is entangled empathy. Um, in the third section, I'll discuss the ways that entangled empathy can respond to what I take to be one of the stronger criticisms that is raised against approaches that are grounded, approaches to ethics that are grounded in moral emotions. Um, as uh, scholar Sharon Krauss puts it in, her book, Civil Passions, Moral Sentiment and Democratic Deliberation, the potential for error is exacerbated in sentimental ethics because, quote, it provides no principled grounds for correcting itself. And so in the third section of my talk, I'm going to discuss how in fact empathy can go wrong, but also importantly, how it can be corrected, refined and ultimately practiced well. And then in the final section, I'll discuss the importance of thinking about empathy beyond the human and why I think entangled empathy is a better approach for thinking about our relationships with other animals. So section one, the empathy skeptics. While there's been a growing renewal of the interests of interest in the moral sentiments of late, some scholars are raising questions about what role, if any, empathy should play in ethics. Does one have to be empathetic in order to be ethical? Is empathy the best or the only or a primary motivation for ethical or moral action? Is empathy needed prior to making moral judgments? Empathy skeptics have answered these related questions with a resounding no. Paul Bloom, for example, who's down the road from me at Yale in Connecticut where I am, um, he's from psychology and Jesse Prince is a philosopher in New York City. Um, they've both been rather critical um, of empathy. Let me do that. Um, here's a quote from Jesse. 
Um, and he's not opposed to sentiment because he's a human. So that means he's actually in favor of thinking about the role of emotion in our moral lives. Um, but he's arguing that empathy is the wrong emotion for ethical and political deliberation. In a typically colorful way, he writes this, that in, a moral, in the moral domain, we should regard empathy with caution um, and suggest that there may be other more important um, emotions such as guilt and anger um, that will help us in our ethical deliberation. So that's just one example. The skeptics don't find empathy particularly helpful in thinking about myriad forms of injustice because they think that it's fundamentally biased and it dis distorts our moral responsiveness. Outrage, anger, indignation, and guilt seem less distorted. I'll leave it to us to discuss this, um, whether or not we think that's the case. Um, a number of the criticisms of empathy are focused on the results from laboratory studies that have been done that show that empathy actually skews or biases our moral judgments. Of particular concern are two distorting features of empathy, what's called in-group bias and what's called the proximity effect. The empathy skeptics are worried that empathy is more often directed to those who are like us, who are in our inner group um, and however that group is construed. And this is a very significant worry to consider in light of the need to regularly challenge the ways that certain forms of privilege, racial privilege, gender privilege, species privilege, provide foundations for ongoing injustice. Skeptics point to a few studies in which, for example, people are shown pictures of faces and um, then, they are, then they are asked questions about how much they empathize with those, those faces. And what ends up happening is that the person empathizing tends to empathize more with someone that looks like them than somebody that doesn't look like them, somebody who might sort of have the same ethnic background. Um, I could imagine it happening, although I haven't read studies where there's um, sort of, if you can have conversation, if you're a Spanish speaker, then you would have more empathy for another Spanish speaker versus me, who's not very good as a Spanish speaker. Um, and so, but, but interestingly, one of the things that has often also been studied is that um, some of the prejudices that have come down make it so that, for example, sometimes Black people, when they look at other Black people, will empathize more with white people because of the privilege that white people have in an anti-Black racist society. So it's a, it's a complicated kind of bias. It's not, it's not just that women will empathize with women and men will empathize with men. There's, there's confounding variables. But Simon Baron Cohen, who's an empathy researcher, put, also says that he's not convinced that any lab studies correspond well to real world behavior. And I agree with him, given that all of us have witnessed people showing great empathy for others who are quite different from themselves, um, it's at least possible that empathy is not limited to those like us. As acts of imagination that move across difference do happen and can be encouraged. Um, personal, professional, and moral relationships between members of different social groups and even different species are in fact quite commonplace, at least for humans to other animals. Um, but Jesse Prince again has argued further that what this shows is that we can be concerned for different others. Um, and he distinguishes concern, moral concern from empathy. Yet in order to be concerned, we must first know that someone has been potentially wronged. And in order to know that, as my colleague Diana Myers has argued, we must be able to imagine how it is for the victim, the one that's wronged or harmed. And this empathetic awareness is what will arouse concern. The ability to imagine how it is for someone else is a component of moral competence and it's empathy that facilitates this sort of moral imagination. I'll say a bit more about um, this in, in, in the next section, but what's important here is that there are mechanisms that are built into empathetic competency that moves one beyond these in-group biases that the skeptics have really grabbed onto. The skeptics allow that we can observe that someone quite different from us um, is 
and not from our in-group is wronged. But what I think is true following Myers is that empathy helps us to perceive when a wrong is committed and it plays a large role in revealing wrongs that one might not be initially attuned to. In addition to worrying about similarity bias or this in-group bias, another reason that skeptics want to reject empathy's role in ethics is that empathy tends to be selectively elicited for those who are close by. And this can distort the proper ethical response to tragedy or misfortune. These proximity effects discriminate in favor of people who are culturally or geographically close and against those who are culturally or ge geographically distant. And empathy is thought to be subject to proximity effects um, that are also sometimes called here and now biases. According to the social psychologist, there's a tendency for people to empathize with and help the victim who was at the focus of their attention than those who might be farther away or absent even when they are reminded that there are a greater number of victims, and even when they're told that greater harms could result from empathizing with the individual who's captured their immediate empathetic attention. Of course, we're reliant on information we have access to, and we're only liable to hear about faraway tragedies if we're already predisposed to find out how we might help those in need, or if we know people who live in those places, or if the news media informs us. And of course, now that we're living in news media bubbles, as they call them, it does present a very real problem whether or not we'll be able to break out to find and notice others who might be um, wronged, harmed, or in need of empathy. But once this information becomes available, I don't see any reason why empathy is any less effective at attending to the well being of others as other ethical theories that may say, maybe just focus on suffering. I'll say more about this in a minute, too, or just focus on um, the capacities of, of another individual. Um, so I think that the, this issue is one that actually can affect many different theories. Um, if you get ang if anger is supposed to be the motivation for ethical deliberation and ethical attention, you're only going to get angry if you know about a problem. If you don't know about the problem, you're not going to get angry about it. So it's not a, that the idea that proximity effects are unique for a, a, a moral system that's based on empathy seems um, wrongheaded to me. Another critic, and this will be the last critic on this um, in this section, um, emphasizes the dark side of empathy and worries about losing oneself in empathizing with another. Empathizers are unable to distinguish, the argument goes, their own feelings or mental states more generally from those of another. And this type of empathy ends up in this way, understanding empathy in this way is actually a form of projection. Um, this is a fellow um, the, who, uh, who wrote this book, The Dark Sides of Empathy, um, and he sees empathy as a kind of narcissism. There's a version, version of it he calls vampire empathy, where people want to manipulate the people they empathize with so that they can live through them in a way or experience the world um, in a way that they enjoy what's happening. And so he gives the example of helicopter parents, um, and he describes these parents as, quote, those who want to live alongside the kids, co-experiencing their life. So they start taking over and they basically want to use the child almost as a pawn. In a sense, extreme helicopter parents are robbing their kids of a selfhood so that they can basically project their own, their own self into these kids. And projection is this worry um, that he's raising as the dark side um, of empathy. But as I'll suggest, this projection is, is really quite avoidable. Uh, the skeptics that I have briefly discussed here um, direct their criticism at a type of empathy that isn't subject to critical reflection. The empathy they have in mind is a somewhat unreflective empathy. It isn't merely reactive, but it seems to be immune to or beyond correction. The empathy that I 
want to argue for and do argue for, in contrast, directs our attention to the things that need moral response and can help provide context and understanding about what the right, right response should be. Okay, the next section is about what empathy is and isn't. So both the concept of empathy and the actual phenomena have been understood in many different, often contradictory ways. In fact, I think when people use the word empathy, they might have their own meaning. It, it's something that means so many different things to so many people. Here on the slide, I just have a few of the um, ways that people have understood it. Um, uh, Jean Dessetti is a psychologist who's an expert in the study of empathy, and this is some of his uh, taxonomy of what empathy is. And I won't read that to you, you could read that yourself, but empathy connects us with an understanding of the circumstances of the other. And this understanding may not be complete, and it often is in need of revisions. The goal is to try to take in as much about another's situation and perspective as possible. And it doesn't involve abandoning one's own attitudes, perspectives, and commitments. It provides an important reference point from which to assess the features of a situation and to ask appropriate moral questions. Importantly, empathetic attunement or empathetic perception is directed towards the well being of another. That's how I think of it. Often empathy is thought as something, it's thought to be something more like an emotional contagion or what gets called effective resonance, which is sort of an emotional um, sort of mirroring, if you will. Um, and it's, it's somewhat reflexive and it's uh, responsive. It, it's not deliberative. Um, this is how some people think of it. It's a kind of embodied response to another individual or individuals in one's immediate environment. This is why the proximity effects that I talked about a minute ago um, become a problem if you understand empathy in this way. This is a basic type of empathy uh, that involves direct perception of the emotions of others. And then it's, some, it's something like it automatically triggers or activates the same emotion in the perceiver without any intervening labeling or cognitive perspective taking processes in play. And this initial response is something that is often difficult to undo. And I think, I think it's a really interesting question whether children would be, whether we have that children are naturally empathetic and what we do over time is dull their um, empathetic capacities, these basic capacities. Um, I think that there's evidence that suggests that um, that's precisely what happens, um, that uh, these natural embodied reactive empathetic responses tend to get um, through both reward and to some extent punishment um, tend to get um, numbed. Alvin Goldman distinguishes this kind of automatic mirroring um, empathy, what he calls lower level empathy from a higher level empathy or what he calls reconstructive empathy. The lower level, as I've been saying, is an automatic um, kind of empathy, whereas the reconstructive or the higher level draws on our imaginative powers to reproduce in our own minds what might have transpired or may be transpiring in the person that we're empath empathizing with. And one of the things that is important to do is to go from, and again, this is Diana, Di I follow Diana Myers here, is to go from the first person pers perspective to the third person perspective and back and forth so that you don't lose yourself the way um, the dark side of empathy um, might have you do. Those of us who have certain cognitive capacities, such as the ability to differentiate between the self and the other, can purposely and thoughtfully take the perspective of another being. And in doing this, we can experience a different form of empathy. The primary difference between those more reactive or more automatic or mirroring forms of empathy and what gets called cognitive empathy is that 
the cog in the cognitive empathy, you're not projecting onto the emotions of the one being empathized with, but rather engaging in a kind of reflective act of imagination that puts you into the other's situation or frame of mind, um, which allows you to take their perspective, but you're also not lost in it or you're not putting your ideas into them your views onto them. So empathy of this sort enables the empathizer not only to grasp the other's state of mind or preferences or interests, as it were, um, to, access, to access her interiority, but to ascertain the features of the situation that affect her and information about what led her to being in the situation she's in in the first place. Now, what I just described, where you're sort of putting yourself, you take, you're, you're engaging in a kind of an imaginative, imaginative um, engagement with the other, trying to see the world through that other's perspective, trying to figure out how she came to be in the situation she's in, who else is in, in play here. This to me is a process. And I think of empathy actually, not as a reaction, but as a process. Um, and we can, and it may not be a linear process. We can think of various parts of the process as something going something like this. The well-being of another grabs our attention. And then the person who's empathizing imagines themselves in this position of the other, and then they make a judgment. So this is why I think it's important to think about judgment and deliberation and reason as all working together in a process so that we, we figure out what it is that is contributing to the other's state of mind or impacting her well being in some way. And then the empathizer can carefully assess the situation and figure out what other information might be needed, what other information is pertinent to effectively empathize with the person in question. So, as I've said, this sort of empathy, it can't separate out emotion from cognition. And it will tend to lead to action because. What draws our attention in the first place is the other's experiential well being. So, once our perception starts this process, um, we'll want to pay critical attention to the broader conditions that impact the well being or the flourishing of those with whom we're empathizing. And this requires attending to things we might not have otherwise. So, empathy of this sort requires gaining perspective and deepening our perspective. And it usually also motivates the empathizer to do something once they have a picture of what's happening for the one that they're empathizing with. This motivational potential, which I think is built into the kind of conception of empathy that I'm arguing for, um, is one of the reasons that philosophers have come back to the moral sentiments after a period of really uh, doing ethical theory from a rationalist point of view. As Vir Virginia Held put it, um, quote, a shortcoming of most standard moral theory is that it construes ethics too much in terms of knowledge, leaving open the question, why care, end quote. Even if I know what I ought to do, why should I do it? Held notes that in quote again, recognizing the component of feeling and relatedness between self and others, the ethics of care, which is I think a part of the view that I'm advocating, um, addresses motivation as an inherent part of the inquiry into right and wrong. So in the psychological literature, empathy is often coupled with a motivational state um, in order for helping action to occur. And generally motivations are thought to be either self-interested or other regarding or altruistic. And I think that the kind of empathy that I'm interested in is not altruistic per se, not self-interested per se, so doesn't fit into that category. But what it does is recognize us as being in relations to others. And I'll say more about relations um, in a little bit. Okay, so 
Recent discussions of how empathetic processes may have involved, evolved in social animals as a capacity that aids in solving social problems suggests that both self-interested and other directed motivations may come online, as it were, when one is empathizing with another. Social cognition is expensive. And in this sense, um, it, because it requires a larger brain and that requires a lot of energy. And so that's why it's, it's costly to have this kind of cognitive and effective and embodied capacity. It would be odd from an evolutionary perspective to have such a resource intensive capacity that didn't also motivate us to act. And I think this is also why I think children also have these capacities. Maybe they're not as developed as they would be if they were allowed to flourish. Um, because I think there's something that is, um, it would be very strange to have a capacity that was so expensive, um, but that didn't drive behavior. Okay, so let me um, talk a little bit about my view more explicitly about entangled empathy. And there's my chimpanzee friend, Shiva. Um, entangled empathy starts from a recognition that we're already in a variety of different sorts of relationships and involves looking anew at our motives for action. When we're engaged in entangled empathy, we're attentive to both similarities and differences between ourselves and our own situation and that of the fellow creatures with whom we're empathizing, humans and non-humans. It's an experiential process that involves as I've been saying, a blend of emotion and cognition in which we recognize we're in relationships with others and are called upon to be responsive to them. And in these relationships, we're going to attend to the needs um, and interests and desires and vulnerabilities and hopes and sensitivities of the others and ourselves. Um, we'll alternate, as I said already, between um, our own perspective and the perspective of the one that we're empathizing with. And in this, we're able to preserve the sense that we're in relationship and not merged into the same um, perspective. Very often, this is a chimpanzee friend of mine named Emma. I do not have any contact with her like that anymore. This is um, a dangerous way to interact with chimpanzees but at that time she was a youngster and she really wanted that kind of engagement. So part of what I wanna say about our relationality, which is a central part of entangled empathy, is that it highlights that we are in a whole range of relationships and it is clear um, that no one, I should say, it's clear that no one would willingly endorse the claim that we want to be in bad relationships. So my, my idea here is that nobody's going to say, yep, I'm in a bad relationship and that's morally okay. So the idea then is it's built into the fact that we're in a whole range of relationships that we want to make them as good as we can make them. And entangled empathy moves us not only to focus on our immediate relationships, but our less obvious relationships to strive to make those relationships better as well. So I think one of the things that is important we can maybe talk about in um, the question and answer time is that there are choices that we make that impact others that are farther away to go back to the near the, the bias that some of the skeptics of, of empathy are worried about. And we can make a decision based on our empathetic understanding of our relationships, say with workers quite far away and decide, nope, I'm not gonna buy this um, t-shirt that was made in a sweatshop because I don't wanna be in that kind of bad relationship with those faraway workers, people I'll never probably meet. Um, but I can, I can recognize that they have interests and needs and hopes and wants and relationships that are nearer to them, vulnerabilities, sensibilities, and in being in an exploited situation uh, for my behalf or for my benefit um, is not something that I would call a good relationship. So I won't want to be in it. Making our relationships as good as we can um, seems like an admirable overreaching ideal, 
and uh, overarching ideal, but we often do face conflicts and have limited time, energy, and resources to figure out how to navigate the ethical demands of all our different relationships. And so that's part of why we need to be able to correct empathetic failures. So I'll turn now um, to talking a little bit and quickly um, about um, these uh, empathetic failures. In my book, Entangled Empathy, I identified two different kinds of um, empathetic failures that need to be corrected. Um, one um, is that we can have epistemic inaccuracies, and the other is that we can have ethical um, failures or ethical inaccuracies. That some people make the mistake of failing to notice the desires, dreams, hopes, vulnerabilities, needs, interests, and perspectives of, other, of others, for example, the worker in a sweatshop, um, does not mean that those of us who are trying to empathize always notice these things accurately. We can make mistakes in our empathetic engagements, but unlike the empathy skeptics, I think there are resources for correcting these mistakes and strategies for, for empathizing better. Um, and so let me just give a, a very quick sort of um, example um, or a couple of very quick examples to just talk through this slide. Um, so sometimes we might over empathize. We might have a friend or a child who is having a bad day and very, very sad. And we then get really sad for them. And it could just be that they're just they're not actually that sad. They just look like they're a little unhappy. Um, and so what we need to do when we're over empathizing is gain greater self-knowledge, know that we're over, we're tend toward sort of uh, drama as it were. And so what we need to do is correct that mistake. Um, the other important mistake that's often made is that we go into a situation, we empathize with the other, we engage in the processes that I've described and we miss something. We have inaccurate empathizing. Um, and that is um, a way, the way to correct that epistemic failure is to gain more information. Um, and the, the question of ethical failure is um, much, much more complicated. Um, and I think that, um, I'm gonna to try to find, I'm skip, gonna skip ahead because I realize I'm taking, um, uh, too much time. Um, there's a lot of, I think, important ways that we, what I call affected, ign affected ignorance here. Um, this is an idea that comes from um, James Baldwin and uh, Michelle Moody Adams, um, two scholars um, in the US. And one of the things that they argue is that it's not simply that you are, you don't have the information that you need, but you have the information, you're just not attending to it. You're allowing various kinds of biases um, and maybe privilege to allow you to ignore that. Um, but there are, I think, in the case of this ethical failure, a lot of avenues for learning more about differences. For instance, much has been written about the perspectives of other animals from those with intimate experiences and particular knowledge of them. There are scholars, for example, who specialize in race or disability or animals, and we have a lot to learn about privilege and its effects from these scholars. The idea that we can't know what it's like really um, to be a chimpanzee or to be somebody who's, if we're not in a wheelchair, to be somebody in a wheelchair, um, often provides an excuse for empathetic failures, for a kind of effective ignorance. Um, and I think we can correct that by um, remedying our, not just our gaps in knowledge, but the empathetic mistakes that we often make. Um, one of the most serious sorts of ethical empathetic failures, I think, occurs when an agent fails to recognize another as the proper object of empathetic attention. Sadly, we consistently witness instances of failure of this kind, failures that stem from a type of cultural um, ignorance to the fact that there are certain others 
um, maybe maybe Native Americans, certain people with disability, incarcerated people, animals whose well-being has been negatively affected by failures of moral attention. Importantly, these failures, they're not failures of knowledge, they're um, social institutions that actually require this failure for their very existence. And these institutions have an interest in promoting and naturalizing the failures. The fact that individuals suffer when they're whipped, poisoned, tortured, starved, isolated, etc., is not mysterious or hard to grasp, even when dominant social institutions try to convince us otherwise. The failure to see these harms as harms needs to be corrected. And these sorts of failures involve failing to take in information that is already available to us. Um, if one's committed to seeing things well, to perceiving well, and when I mean well here, I mean ethically perceiving well, then she'll alter her choices such that she's not going to purposely ignore the relevant information or relegate it to the background of her thinking and acting. Indeed, she'll seek out all the relevant information in order to judge how she affects the well being of individuals with whom she's in relationships. And as I've said, these relationships can be quite varied and also with individuals that are far away. Okay, so let me um, try to end um, by talking a little bit about our how the fourth section, how to think about empathy um, beyond the human and think about empathy with other animals. This is an image that I got from a sanctuary for, 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 for um, formerly farmed animals. It's hard to say, formerly farmed animals. And one of the things that's very important in both sanctuary work um, and in the work of two philosophers who have been um, arguing for what they call a zoopolis, Will Kimlicka and Sue Donaldson, is that we start to see other animals as beings with whom we're in relation, who, as they put it, are also, at, particularly when it comes to domestic animals like these animals, um, are fellow citizens, or as Chris Korsgaard puts it, um, who are fellow creatures. Now, one of the things that happens in thinking about our, our ethical relationships with other animals is that we have particular um, theories that guide our relationships. Usually it's a consequentialist or utilitarian theory, or it's a Kantian theory. And so when I said fellow citizens, um, there's a really wonderful new book by Kantian philosopher Chris Korsgaard, who argues that we that these are fellow creatures. But one of the things that I want to argue is that when we have these individual capacities, the individual, um, what happens in both the traditional normative theories, utilitarianism and Kantianism, is we have particular kinds of capacities that we have as humans and we decide that it's okay to recognize them in non-humans. But this creates a hierarchy. And with hierarchies, we end up in very difficult positions where sometimes, and I I don't, I, let me see if I could do this. Yes, um, sometimes this is an, a, an old kind of pedigree of man, but what we see is that there are eight men, there's man, and then there's eight men. And those eight men were actually Africans. And I think part of what happens when we see these kinds of hierarchies is we do get the kind of um, uh, closeness bias and that uh, allows for us to put others below us. And I think that's a, that's a really dangerous and problematic way of going. We take a capacity that we think is valuable, not suffering or not, not wanting to suffer. We see that other animals, this is a Peter Singer sort of argument. We see that other animals are suffering and that they're suffering um, means that we should attend to them, but it's a very individualistic capacity-based approach. And so it ends up in the thinking of these theorists that those human beings that don't share those capacities may end up 
lower in the hierarchy, just as some animals, maybe fish, others end up lower in the hierarchy. And that is, I think, in many ways prejudicial. And also, um, that is a way in which human capacities remain at the center. It overlooks what's important from the other animal's point of view and the neat, unique capacities that they may have um, that are worth our um, consideration. And so I think that the view that I've been arguing for is a view that allows us to not focus on individual characteristics. It's a view that allows us to um, recognize ourselves as fundamentally in relationship with others. And it doesn't matter if those others have the kinds of capacities um, that we imagine we have. We don't have to project them on to others. Um, but I think that the idea is that when we see it's in relate, it's not that we have a particular ethical responsibility to another because they have a capacity, but rather we have an ethical responsibility to another because we're in relationship to them and we wanna make our relationships right. And I know I'm over time, but I wanna just suggest that that framework of ethical thinking is a very, very important in how we think about our relationships beyond the human. And I think that entangled empathy ultimately gives us a much better theoretical frame for thinking about not just our relationships with one another, but our relationships to other animals. Thanks. Thank you so much, Laurie. That was great. Thank you for a fascinating talk, um, which I'm sure will generate many questions. I would now like, like to, um, to introduce Pelayo Benavides, who will be providing a, a brief response. Um, Dr. Benavides studied psychology at an undergraduate level at the Pontificia Universidad Católica de Chile where he currently works as a researcher and lecturer at the university's Villarica campus. He obtained a graduate diploma in arts and a master of arts in social anthropology at Massey University in New Zealand. And he also holds a PhD in social anthropology from the University of Aberdeen, where he researched human animal relations and environmental knowledge, focusing on the case of protect protected predators, lo local rural inhabitants and park ranchers in areas around a national and a private park in southern Chile. His main research interests are cognitive anthropology and its connection with environmental knowledge, in particular, the issue of human animal relations. He also worked on intercultural education, traditional narratives, and the social cultural analysis of humans and nature nexus. Pelayo, um, if you can provide your comments in about 10 minutes, that would be great. So then we have time for, for questions. OK, thank you very much. I'll, I'll try to be quick uh, reading my, my take on uh, entangled empathy, based mainly also on uh, Laurie Gruen's book. Uh, her approach to ethics makes uh, perfect sense to people working in anthropology, with its focus on ground situations and, and shifting complexities. Uh, with this in mind, let me share a the following ethnographic vignette, um, which I remembered when reading uh, Professor Gruen's book. It concerns an encounter with a fox present for some time in a, in a private sanctuary uh, called the Cañi, uh, who interacted with visitors looking for food handouts. This fox case is an interesting example because it presented a situation where categories regarding wildness and nature were tensioned and inevitably discussed due to the animal's initiative. Um, my first encounter with her or him, I never knew if it was a male or female, was also the first occasion in which I had been so close to a fox. So I went up the, to the sanctuary during field work one morning to trim the paths, um, arriving to a certain place where no tourists in sight were there or on the way. And I sat on the big log to rest, drink water and eat something. And almost immediately a fox arrived, this fox arrived. Uh, it was a relatively small creature and um, uh, gray with a typical bushy tail. Its face was indeed a mixture of a dog and a cat, I thought, and perfectly ambiguous look for an ambiguous animal. With uh, narrow eyes and almost as if smiling, it cautiously approached me sniffing and looking intently at my rucksack. It gave me the impression that it already identified these kinds of objects as the containers of what it looked for. 
or maybe it was just a matter of good sense of smell. Nevertheless, it was clear that it had its own agenda and interests during our interaction. Its ears pricked and moved accordingly each time the rapping of my cereal bar made a noise, impelling it to move slightly closer, but always at a safe distance. Despite its desire for food, I was convinced that feeding this wild animal was harmful. In the end, it retreated to a spot further away. It was a strange encounter because it felt similar to the common experience in Chile of being approached by stray dogs. At the same time, it was clear that it was different. There was something distinct in the foxiness of its movements and dispositions. It did not have the familiar begging attitude of dogs. It looked at me in a sharp, calculating way with an analytical quality, feeling as a more horizontal interaction. This relates strongly with Mullins and, and author's assertion that foxes show disturbing signs of possessing human-like intelligence of forethought. Finally, I believe my experience relates to what Ingle, Tim Ingle points to when saying that, I quote, humans and animals relate to one another, not in mind or body alone, but as undivided centers of intention and action as whole beings, end of quote. I think this is what this was uh, displayed by both of us during our brief encounter, and that's why it felt strangely egalitarian. I wonder if there was some kind of a basis for an entangled empathy here in an encounter crossed by some of the fundamental questions in the field of human-animal studies. Were my interpretations of the fox behaviors reasonable, accurate? Was this some kind of mere projection of my own cognitive and emotional states? Were they an expression of my desire to bridge that gap of not really knowing the subjective world of the fox? Interestingly, these are some of the issues that the concept of entangled empathy considers and deals with. Moreover, it is presented as an effort to deal with grounded ethical problems, avoiding a detached and highly abstract approach. I would highlight in this sense the following points of Laurie Gruen's book, Entangled Empathy, and I quote, in the hands of academic philosophers, Ethical theory has become a rarefied business with little relevance to the actual people confronting moral issues. And of course, she adds to this that she is increasingly dissatisfied with this style of argumentation. For all their clarity, these arguments, which are perfect examples of the kinds of arguments that are most often made in ethics, force us to focus in too narrow a way and they flatten or erase the complexity of actual moral problems. End of quote. She identifies the detached and mechanical nature of traditional ethical argumentations that indeed seems to distance people from a practice that should interpret their everyday experiences and conundrums. In her view, in the regular ethics approach, there's a re reduction of moral agents to calculators that also stereotypes the individual suffering as objects to be aided. They are nameless, interchangeable. Uh, we only recognize them as victims of absolute poverty, or in the case of animals, as food that is either treated nicely or cruelly. We don't attend to the particularities of their lives and their communities and the relationships they are in. Paying attention to the particularities can also help us keep in check condescending attitudes, culturally imperialistic judgments, and more pernicious forms of anthropocentrism. End of quote. In my view, entangled empathy is a wayfaring perspective attuned to an uncertain world full of non-resolved issues. There are interesting reflections on the value of non-resolved complexities because they can be derived in spoiled patterns, but such disorder is what presents the unlimited potential for new orderings, even though this will be inevitably unstable in the long run. On this issue, Moll and Law assert that simplifications aimed at reducing complexities to whatever it is that fits into simple scheme, frequently end up neglecting such complexities altogether. These authors stress, for instance, how academic texts organize bewildering phenomena in smooth schemes and clean overviews of li li linear logics. This results in turning the surprising or disturbing into regularity through explanations where academic texts grapple with strange things, but in a calm tone. I believe something similar may, may happen in the ethics field. And that is what Gruen's work is precisely identifying and highlighting. I quote her again. Since ethical theories force us to focus on certain features of a situation in a narrow way, the narrow focus flattens or erases the complexity of actual moral problems. This failure of capturing the richness and the moral experience uh, is something that is clearly in, in, in pover, uh, it tends to impoverish the situations that we are dealing with. In this way, specific cases should be taken as phenomena in their own right slightly differing in unexpected ways from other cases. 
a fruitful consideration of this should avoid the process of making them fit into general frames as mere representatives of them, as an obliged way to present specificities. This approach would reject the process of hegemonic regularity, creation or closure <clears throat> of unfolding processes through the loss of richness. Going back to the question regarding the efforts to empathize with other animals, Gruen directly addresses the issue as part of the complexities present in an entangled empathy. And I quote her again, even when individuals are genuinely attempting to take the perspective of another, when they are mindful of the dangers of substituting their own frame of reference, their own interests, desires, or beliefs about what is good for the other, or ideological commitments about the good for, for those with whom they are empathizing, the possibility always remains that they have not adequately understood the other. This is true among human beings as well as between humans and other animals." End of quote. Crucial here is, I think, her assertion that this requires an openness to learning and gathering information across differences, together with a commitment to critical reflection and the close exchange with people who have the experience with and knowledge of the life worlds of specific others. In this case, I would say other animals. Thus, considering human-animal relations and ethical problems, several categories that play a role there are not completely pre-existent and independent of those human-animal engagements being applied as pre-programmed instructions. They are emergent phenomena from those engagements, and through them, they are in flux, being shaped and reshaped in different degrees according to varying contexts. I suppose that this may be related with the notion of a co-constituted agency that Lori Gruen highlights as the entangled aspect of entangled empathy in her article in the journal Ibadia. So I would finish by this, uh, uh, calling to this notion of holding to the whole. To reflect on the previous discussion, we can use a couple of metaphoric images inspired by Langan. This referred to a property or characteristic that is recognized by various authors, including Lori Gruen, when she speaks about the protean entanglements that emerge in the world in her book. An eloquent mythical image is that of Menelaus grappling with the old sea god Proteus, representing the ever morphing waters. Menelaus is successful in his wrestling and attains final knowledge extracted from Proteus once defeated. The victory is possible because he holds to the holding, not to the passing shape. Particular forms are transient with a variety of permanencies, which nevertheless always pass. It is, after all, mobilis in mobili. We are moving in a moving thing. On the contrary, a fixation over the pattern, the sign, the name, and the already known turns it into an isolated element. The attention focuses intensively on one aspect and the complexity of dynamic relations and processes is diminished or lost. The preeminence is given to what I already know. Consequently, efforts will be made to forcibly fit the world to my categories, pushing for a static reality. I mean, I believe this might lead to the obliteration of particular emerging histories of entanglements among different beings. Here, a contrasting image is that of Sinbad in his fifth voyage, trapped by the old man of the sea. This time, the grapple hold is on the hero, controlling him through an asphyxiating, asphyxiating lock by evil legs, crouch on the back of his neck, commanding him to do whatever the old man wishes. I believe this might be also the case with an ethics corpus that, as Gruen asserts, flattens the complexity of moral problems and provides an image of a static world full of pre-existing realities and categories. Finally, I think that Lori Gruen's entangled empathy is more attuned to what Tim Ingle describes as the main element in the animistic worldviews, where continuities are indices of movement, growth, and circulation, instead of identity and sameness, and where differences speak of a world of differentiation, being emergent and interstitial, and not a world of diversity, where differences are resultant and superficial. A deep consideration of entanglement brings forward a world of becoming and on the making, and not a world of being and ready-made. It is the formal world, in my view, the one that allows meaningful relations with other organisms, particularly with other animals, and better conditions to deal with the moral conundrums that coexistence in this planet brings along. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pelayo.
Um, before opening our virtual floor to questions, I wanted to give the opportunity to Laurie to um, briefly um, comment on Pelayo's response, if she wishes to. I'd, I'd just like to thank Pelayo, and also um, I wanted to just say one thing about the sort of mystery of the Fox encounter. Um, and I, I think um, I really, um, I'm very pleased with what you said in general about um, as an anthropologist, that this is that this view is um, is welcome because I I have learned a lot from anthropologists, um, but I've also learned a lot from the people who spend time with these other animals, and I think that that is another way of thinking about that. When you have, um, I guess you could use the ethnographic uh, sensibility to under, to see the way that other other humans who spend a lot of time with fox or foxes or octopuses, which is the new sort of craze or other um, chimpanzees in my case or other animals that there is some kind of, it's not, I don't wanna deny that the sort of the wonder and the beauty of that encounter, but I think there's also some, some knowledge that we can get from people who have immersed themselves in an, similar to an ethnographic study of those other animals. Um, and so there's a sort of interesting tension that I'd, I'd like to think more about, but I thank you so much for your comments. Great. Um, well, I already see some hands uh, raised. So we'll be taking the questions in the order that they appear. You're welcome to um, raise your hand um, and you, also, you can also formulate them in the chat. I will be giving an eye on that. The first person who raised his hand was Pablo, Pablo Henny. Uh, thank you very much, Sophia, and, uh, and Professor Laurie. Um, um, so, um, and also uh, Professor Pelayo's uh, uh, part that he tried to explain from his own experience uh, uh, what had to do with, 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 with what the previous uh, presentation had to do, or whatever, sorry. Uh, because it's not my field, I'm a bit confused, but here is my question. Uh, when you talk about empathy um, and put all these, uh, um, uh, I mean, uh, questionings or, or thoughts that uh, say that empathy maybe between humans is not a good concept to put forward for several reasons that you put in your first uh, piece, uh, part of, the, of your presentation, I, I think I have no problem at all with that. I think that that, that solves uh, at least in my case, with, with disagreements, uh, for example, human rights or all that kind of things, uh, that I don't feel there is any contradiction or, or, or any difficulty in dealing with that a, a concept of empathy and, in, in humans. But of course, the problem, as Professor Pelayo puts it, I guess, from what I understood, uh, is with, with animals particularly. And uh, so my question basically is, does it help this, this concept of empathy, particularly with other organisms, um, developing this concept and make it more uh, I mean, uh, broadly known or broadly appreciated by, by people to how does it help to solve this contradiction that I see? Because I, I, I understand, I, I, I do nothing wrong to other humans. Uh, uh, for me, that's all again. But if I have to kill an animal to eat it, which I do, or to sacrifice an animal to do science, which also I do, um, I don't see how feeling or, or, or knowing that I'm empathetic with that or, other animal uh, will do something to resolve this, to solve this, this deep contradiction, which is to take in the life of other, uh, other organism for something that it's, that it's useful for me or even for them. Um, so, so I would like you to, you to talk about a little bit about this because then I think, okay, what happens with vegetarians and then with the uh, vegan movement, which is all right. Uh, and then I say, well, what happens with eating vegetables? Put it in the context of what you said that we, we should feel empathy or empathy should be something we, we think about because we think we are part of, 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 of an entire system in which we have, re we have a relation with every, every piece of life that there is in this herd. And, in addition to that, sorry <laughs> to being so long, is, is, is that I, at the end I see that we end also again, probably in a more sophisticated generally again, for animals, close animals, and then other type of animals, insects, and at the end, vegetables or bacteria that we don't care at the end. So yeah, 
Thank you. Um, so uh, it's interesting that you raised this question of, of plants. Um, the environmentalists have often gotten onto me saying, oh, this is not a good theory. You can't empathize. It doesn't extend to to plant life. And so it's it's exclusionary. And and it does my view is that um, I think there's ways um, of, of of empathizing with uh, all sorts of animals. Um, for me to, to empathize with another, there has to be some other what it's like to be that thing, that being, what it's like to be that thing, having, having uh, a kind of awareness, uh, umwelt, as um, Jakob von Uxkol would call it. It's a, it's a, if that other being has a perspective, then that would be what's necessary to take that perspective, which is a part of what empathy does. Now, of course, there's a question about whether ticks have a perspective, von Uxkol in his, um, and his discussion, of Umwelt thinks that there is a tick that has a perspective, that ticks do have a perspective. So there's a, that's a place where we could get into a discussion about whether we think there's a perspective there or not. Trees do not, vegetables, you know, plants, they do not have a perspective, but then there's botanists who say they do so. So <laughs> it's, it's, I think those are questions that could be asked. For me though, the idea is that, um, if there is a clear perspective to be taken, then one is able to be in empathetic relation to that other, even if that other is very different. And I think we have very good understanding of fox, of cows, of chimpanzees, of whales, that they have a perspective that we can begin to start to empathize. We need, we need, we need both more um, understanding and, and, and knowledge about them, um, but I do think that we can empathize with them. I perhaps someday we'll find out that we can um, empathize with um, those beings that we think um, now don't have a perspective and we come to learn that. And if you think about it historically, I mean, talking about long history, we used to think, I mean, it used, people had all sorts of faulty ideas about who, what other people had perspectives or didn't have perspectives. Um, and I think had views that animals were just automaton, they didn't have perspectives. And I think now we know they do have perspectives. And so for me, the idea is that if you have a perspective, if there's something that it's, be, it's like to be you, then that's the way that you can bring the empathy over into that particular area. But I see a lot of hands, so I'll stop talking. Thank you, uh, Laurie. Uh, Andrea Casals, you're next. Yes, thank you very much, Laurie, and everyone for organizing this um, wonderful talk. Um, you, I am a literary scholar, and I've been working in environmental humanities like for the last 10 years or something, started out with eco-criticism. So I'm really interested in, you caught my attention with this uh, reflective act of imagination. And I'm concerned here, how can we, sort of like project this idea of empathy as a reflective act of imagination when we're thinking of climate change and the future impacts. Uh, how can we sort of like carry on that reflective act of imagination for a situation or experience that we are not exposed to yet, but we know that many others similar or not to us will have a perspective about that. Mm -hmm. That's a great question, Andrea. Thank you for asking that. I, I think um, one of the things that I think is really promising and um, uh, for me enlivening about entangled empathy is that it, it does ask us to hone our imaginative skills. And insofar as we're engaged in these kinds of imaginative acts in the here and now, we can also, as I was saying earlier, we can we can empathize with those that are distant in space geographically. Um, so I think it's not that unimaginable to empathize with others over time. Um, and I'm I believe, and I, I said this fat quickly earlier, but I believe we can get things wrong. That that's absolutely. 
a part of what it means to do this kind of work. We don't want to sit there and be wrong and be like, oh yeah, I got that wrong. But then we improve our empathetic and imaginative skill, right? We hone that capacity. Um, and I think that's one of the real um, important and compelling ideas about entangled empathy is that we can do this. We're not saying you have to get it completely right, um, but you can imagine what it would be like to well, I mean, we can imagine it now. We, what is it like to lose your home when the sea levels rise? We, we can imagine that quite vividly. Um, and we can imagine how it, I, I mean, I can, we could all imagine it with our students. Our, our students are very different today than they were 10 years ago or 20 years ago, because their futures look really different to them than the students 20 years ago. So I think this is a way in which we have all sorts of bits of information and um, awareness of the of how people are experiencing these climate changes and i think we can use our imagination better to to sort of motivate change thanks laurie juan also wanted to ask a question juan Larain. thank you very much thank you laurie very interesting i have a very simple question perhaps a little bit different but do you think that our current life that is going through virtual meetings, uh, virtual relationships, mm -hmm. is going to impact empathy? Can we evolve a way on learning how to empathize through, through the screen? And perhaps I'm very worried about the impact on, on education, especially of uh, young kids and, and young students, uh, undergraduates. So uh, what is your thinking about that? That's a, a, uh, that's a really uh, timely and excellent um, thoughtful question. I, um, I think I, I think that there's, uh, it's going to depend on the context in which the screens so, so if you're isolated, and you have not very much contact at all with others, um, I embodied sort of experiential contact with others over a long period of time, I think that that will probably distort empathy. I think empathy um, really is at least developing uh, developing empathetic skills and practicing empathetic skills does does require a kind of uh, more embodied engaged back and forth with others and it's from those immediate others that we can then imagine how to interact with more distant others um, I think um, I think that that's one thing. Now I'm going to say something very strange. So I'm going to preface it with a very strange thought. I actually think that virtual reality is something that can enhance empathy. And virtual reality, I, I don't know if everybody's aware of this technology, but um, it's a technology that I became aware of over the course of the pandemic. And um, I actually think that technology not this technology with boxes, but other kinds of technology can help us to develop empathetic concern. Um, so I'm not gonna say that these boxes are going to maybe help, they probably will hinder it. But I think there's other technological ways of um, supplementing experiential embodied understanding and virtual reality may be one of them. That's a very strange answer I realize, but I'm working on this. This is, I'm, I'm interested in this project um, of developing empathy through uh, virtual reality. So that like Pelia was saying, you don't, you have this fox encounter, but you don't have the actual fox encounter. You encounter the fox or the, or the elephant in a virtual uh, setting. Thank you. Alejandra Mancilla. Thank you. That was super interesting. Uh, so my question part answered. So I was going to ask you about you want to go with your entangled empathy and you seem to say like as far as pathos go so i was curious because this puts you in a way closer to singer the same group of things that you uh want to say are morally considerable but what you said resonated a lot with what what val plumwood would say about an ethics of relationality and including others so i just wanted to hear your thoughts on you think of those two authors. Uh, I know you don't want to go along the singer line. In a way, that you're considering is pretty much the same. Uh, and with Plumwood, you emphasize relations, but only so far. So I was curious to hear more on that. 
Yeah, um, I mean, I know both of their work really well. Um, and I myself am an ecofeminist like Val um, was. And um, I, you, I did, and I say this at the beginning of Entangled Empathy, the book, um, my view is, is really distinct from the view that Singer has. Um, and it is distinct in so many ways at this point that he doesn't have any idea what I'm talking about with entangled empathy. So it's not that I'm going, it's not that, you know, I'm going along with him because there's a real, there's a real divergence. The place where there's a difference, and this is going to probably be too. So Val Plumwood talks about um, earth others and the idea of earth others um, has a way of animating the non-animate and, or uh, that's not exactly the right way to put it, but a way of, let's say, giving voice to those that don't actually um, have perspectives to speak of. And I think the only thing I would have to say about the way I differ from what, what Val Plumwood is arguing is that my view is one that you have to have a perspective. There has to be a perspective in order to take that perspective. And that if you're projecting a perspective or imagining a perspective or, pro yeah, projecting is uh, like thinking that there is a perspective, that there's um, a worry about speaking for the other. And I don't think that that's a very important, um, I think it's a, not a good way to go, um, to speak for others, um, especially when there's no perspective to, to push back against, right? Um, I, I think that might have been what you were getting at of, of Val's notion of Earth Others. Is that right? Yeah, yeah no, that's right. And uh, I'm still curious because in a way, the group of beings that you're uh, concerned with is the same that Singer is concerned with. So I, yeah, I, I see that your approaches are very different, but in, the, in, in a way you're both focused on pe things that have pathos uh, and that's it. Uh, so. Yeah, maybe there are more points of encounter than what you both think. I'm just curious. Yeah, I mean, I think I mean, I think it's a really interesting question, but I do think that um, if if I can say this, that um, who counts is is already a question um, that I think is needs a different. I'm not answering that. I guess I'm I'm not answering that. That's not the question I'm answering. And I think what I'm suggesting is. Who can you empathize with? Well, here's who you can empathize with. Who counts? You could have a whole theory about wonder and beauty and awe. And I talk a little bit about this in one of my chapters on environmentalism and it, um, how far does an, an empathy go? But empathy isn't meant to um, suggest that the, the marsh that I love so much that I live near, um, in the wetlands, um, that, that, that the wetlands have a perspective, but they matter. They mad, the wetlands matter to me considerably. And if you empathize with me and I care about the wetlands, then you have to care about the wetlands. But it's not that you empathize with the wetlands. So I guess that's a that's a difference. For Singer, it stops full stop at sentience, right? If you're not sentient, um, he's not really interested in perspective. He's interested in suffering. And so if 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 you don't suffer, you don't matter. For me, there's a whole range of ways of thinking about the value of the more than human world. Um, it's just that empathy isn't the thing that's going to get you directly into recognizing, um, empathizing with the tree or, or not. Um, and, and that's something, I mean, environmentalists argue with me about that. I'm okay with that argument. But I, the idea is that um, I, there's no perspective there that I, I feel like I can take. And so I don't wanna uh, extend the notion of entangled empathy um, to, you know, let's say trees, wetlands, forests, um, that sort of thing. But there are wondrous, long-lived, beautiful, um, valuable beings in the world. It's just that we don't empathize necessarily with all the beings that there are. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Laurie. Um, Jessica Jimple was hoping to ask a question as well. Hi, Laurie. Thanks for Hi. that very interesting talk. Um, I work uh, 
in animal welfare in, uh, with um, animals in, involved in research at the university and I have to look up about their welfare. So uh, suffering is indeed uh, a subject to me. So I wanted to know more about your views, which um, I share what I've heard today. So I'm, I'm encouraged now to read your book to broaden my horizons. And, and I have to say, I don't agree uh, a lot with uh, Peter Singer. So I'm not going there, but still suffering is at the center of many of the uses, perhaps not many, but some of the uses that we um, um, do with animals. So uh, if you're thinking about empathy in relation to relationships, rather than uh, capacity of suffering, for example, or other capacities or uh, enjoying to, to put it in, um, how can one go about this, um, use of animals that that we we perform all the time especially when you're thinking about the ones that um, are uh, by necessity um, that are uh, that provoke suffering such as what we do in research sometimes it's not a lot of suffering but there's some and sometimes there is a lot of suffering so how can you sort of uh, go around that and um, and, and worry about that through empathy without taking into account the suffering. I don't know if, if, if I'm making myself clear here. Right, so, um, okay, so my view does attend to suffering. It's one of many things that we are attending to when we're um, empathizing with others, but it's not the only thing that we're attending to when we're um, uh, empathizing with others. Um, and uh, whether or not, uh, for example, whether or not an, uh, an animal is able to have relationships with other animals, for example, is, is really important. The fact, if they're social animals in particular. So social animals, um, so let me just use my, my chimpanzee examples. Um, chimpanzees, uh, are very very food motivated they're extraordinarily food motivated captive chimpanzees um care a lot about food and if they had to choose between food and other chimpanzees they would pick other chimpanzees hopefully they wouldn't have to make the choice that they could have both food and other chimpanzees um and they also really really don't like being inside they <laughs> they want to be outside um, so this raises a whole range of welfare kinds of questions. Um, are they suffering when they're indoors? I don't know. It depends on what you mean by suffering. But is their life not going as well as it could? Yeah, that's definitely true. They have a strong interest, a strong desire to be outside with other chimpanzees. And what does that often mean? Well, that what that sometimes means, because chimpanzees are also very violent with one another, is that they're going to, because they do this, they have this social relations where they um, harm each other and then engage in conciliatory behavior with one another. Um, somebody like Singer, who would have a view about suffering, would say, you have to separate those chimpanzees because they're causing each other physical pain. But that's a mistake because it's not taking into account the whole range of interests and desires and the things that make their lives meaningful. Um, and so they're used to getting injured and reconciling um, and freaking out when somebody's um, acting up and then calming down. And this is just part of what makes their lives meaningful to them. And so if you're only focusing on suffering, you would do, end up potentially doing something that would be sort of not leading them, not allowing them to live the best life they can live. And I think these are really important considerations for thinking about a broader understanding of animal welfare. When, and this is something that's happening in the zoo and aquarium world in a big way, is they're not just thinking about feeding and making sure there aren't physical injuries, but trying to make the lives of the animals that are in captivity in various parts of the world as robust, as meaningful as possible. And so welfare is just one piece of um, a larger picture. That, and that's, I think, where um, 
a very clear where, place where Singer and I disagree. I would only add to that, that that makes a lot of sense to me, what you say about the chimps. But I think that is um, valid when you have an environment where, where they can actually, um, as you say, flourish or mm -hmm. perform all the behaviors that they would. Uh, I'm thinking about, for example, mice. They do fight a lot too. And, and we do separate them, but we didn't separate them because they are not in a natural environment as where they normally live. They would effectively kill each other. So, and, and chimps might do too if you put them in an enclosure, which is not um, good for them. Right. So, so I think that that works in a sort of uh, at least perhaps not natural, but semi-natural environment that has some of the of the main characteristics of where the animals normally um, lead their lives. Or how right. but, but what I would suggest is that this, this um, and I think there's, there's a couple of people, a um, couple of uh, neuroscientists that are also suggesting this, that, that having more natural enclosures for research animals is actually better for everybody because you get better results as well. And so the, the idea that there is this problem that they're not living a flourishing life should, I would hope, encourage people to think differently about what it is they're doing, how they're housing and keeping animals captive. Um, and it's an important area that's being developed in um, captive animal well-being um, in the zoo and aquarium world. And I think it'll probably, hopefully, trickle into um, the research world as well, because you'll get better results from animals that live more naturalistic lives. Thank you. Thank you both. Um, I have one last comment and a question in the chat uh, and we're just about um, the time. So we'll just have a few more minutes, but if that's okay, I'll go the reverse way. I'll read the comment and then I'll read the question so that I, I can give you the, the last word, Laurie. Um, the comment is from Jenny Rudlinger Stenden, who writes, I think sometimes empathy involves stepping out of our comfort zone and taking concrete steps in our own lives which may involve giving up something we are used to or that we enjoy, like what happens with farm animals and the decision to stop exploiting them. I don't know if it's really the lack of information in those cases or if at least that's the main problem. Excellent presentation and the topic so much important in these times. Thank you very much. Um, and there was also a question from Valeria de los Rios who writes, um, from your perspectives, can empathy towards non-human animals and the care ethics associated with it be built from forms of mediation, such as the arts, for instance, literature, visual arts, cinema, etc. Looking at the ways of correcting empathetic failures, um, is only a problem, is it only a problem of lack of information or of knowledge? Oh, should I answer that question? I think yes, that will be the last question. So. Okay. <laughs> Okay. Um, yes, I think this is a really great question. It's 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 a lack of a variety of things. I think that's a really important um, intervention. It's not just a lack of information. It's a lack of appreciation. It's a lack of knowledge. It's a lack of attunement. Um, it can be a lack of a, a number of things. Um, and the arts are very important in bringing that about. Um, it's part of why I think there's there's potential also in this virtual reality area to try to develop um, and hone our our. Uh, entangled empathy skills. Um, and I do think that um, ultimately what my hope is, is that um, the, the entangled empathy will allow us to think very, very differently and creatively and critically about the relationships that we're in, relationships of domination um, and relationships of harm and neglect, um, relationships of privilege, those kinds of things really we need to think much more seriously about um, as things have been sort of falling apart, as it were, to put it mildly. Thank you, Laurie. There's a note of optimism in there. <laughs> um, thank you so much for your time. It's been, it's been a great presentation. It's been a wonderful um, instant dialogue and conversation. So we're very grateful that you took part in, in this seminar. Thank you for having me and engaging. And I would like to maybe also announce the next uh, instance in the in the seminar cycle, uh, which will be the 22nd of June at 4 p.m. 
where um, it's Carter Sneed from the University of Notre Dame who is invited and will be presenting a talk entitled What It Means to Be Human. So quite a vast program here as well. Thank you very much again, Laurie. It's been, it's been a fantastic uh, conversation. Thank you.